we're going to talk today about something that I think is very, very important. We've mentioned this word many times, and uh, it is the word hermeneutics. Now, in order to understand the Bible, you have to have hermeneutical principles. Well, what is hermeneutics? It is a science. Actually, it's the science that helps us to understand and interpret all of literature. If you're going to take a book and you want to understand it, there are certain things that you must know, certain things that you must assume in advance in order to understand what the person has written in order to benefit from it. And so therefore, you uh, enlist the help of hermeneutical principles. And once you do this, you can determine what the writer has written and how it affects you, what it means to you. Now, I don't mean this in a subjective way. Uh, people are always taking this, well, what does the Bible mean to you? And that, uh, that makes me angry. The Bible means the same to everyone. Now, the application might be somewhat different, but let me mark it down. The Bible means the same to everyone. It doesn't mean something different to you and different to me. And I always use the example of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, if you have Christ, you have life. If you don't have Christ, you don't have life. Now, what does that mean to you? If it means something different than what it says, you're not saved, you see. It means the same thing to you as it does to me, and that is you have to believe in Christ alone for your eternal life. Now, uh, some people understand that principle, and yet they go beyond that, and the rest of doctrine is subjective. And that's why there are churches today who are afraid to put out their doctrinal statements. In fact, we've talked about the so-called Willow Creek experience, and some of the other churches, associated with them um, with that fiasco and Willow Creek teaches don't put out your doctrinal statements don't let people know what you believe sort of sneak up on them you know and I want to tell you that here behind this pulpit in this church we're not afraid of what we believe you ask me and I'll tell you Straight, straightforward, and we'll go right to the Bible and show you. We're not afraid here. Why? Because we have hermeneutical principles. In fact, we have the greatest principle for understanding the Bible that's ever been given. And we'll see that in just a little bit. But if you want to understand the original intent of any author, you have to apply hermeneutical principles. If you want to understand the Bible and its authors, you must have biblical hermeneutics. And so basically, that's what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to limit them to the science of interpreting the Scripture through the Apostle Paul. Now, we do that here because we believe that the Apostle Paul, and not Peter, is the Apostle for Gentiles in the dispensation of grace in which we live. And so that if we're going to approach the Bible and understand it correctly, we must see it as he tells us to see it. Jesus Christ gave him hermeneutical principles to give to the body of Christ, to give to people in this dispensation. And so therefore, we're going to look at those principles that will help us understand the Bible. Okay, now the first thing we want to do is look at verse number four. In Romans chapter 15, because dispensationalists are always being accused of, well, you only take certain books of the Bible and you throw out the rest of it. Well, what about the books of Moses and Peter and John and so forth? Well, to that we would say, hey, wait one second. Paul tells us, for whatsoever things in the scriptures he's referring to were written aforetime were written for our learning. Now, does Paul tell us that we are to study all of the Bible? Right there he does, absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Every book in the Bible is to be addressed eventually uh, in the Christian's life by the time he is saved and until the time he goes home to be with the Lord. At least that is the, that is the goal. That's what you're trying to do. So nothing is left out. 
It is very, very important to understand that. Uh, in fact, uh, he goes on, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three. He goes on to tell us that all scriptures, verse number 16, is given by inspiration of God and is therefore profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, completely outfitted in, in other words. But now, while we're here, I want to give us a hermeneutical principle. Okay? Now, the hermeneutical principle right here is the law of antecedents. What is the law of antecedents? It means that there is a precedence for pronouns or other words in context that refer back to something. Now we're going to uh, look at, um, at a few, but while we're here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at a precedence here. What is the law of antecedents? It means that there is a word, there is a phrase, a clause that is referred to by a pronoun in the context so that you will understand what that pronoun or who that pronoun is referring back to. It's either a word or group of words that is replaced uh, or referred to by a substitute. So if you are reading and you read thus and so and thus and so, and then you come down and there is a pronoun there, such as he or she or it, you have to immediately look in the context prior in order to understand what he's referring to. Now, I say that because I've had a question regarding this portion. There, there's a pastor, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, that I love dearly, who says in verse number 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And his uh, quote, uh, take on this, his interpretation of it was, that only means Paul's scriptures. That only means what Paul, when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, that only means his scriptures. Now, mind you, it would be much easier if he was referring to just his own scriptures because uh, so many uh, people uh, uh, are accusing and, and blaming dispensationalists for not taking all the Bible and so forth. We are established by the scriptures of Paul. However, that's not all we're established by. Paul gives us principles by which we can be benefited, helped, blessed, and established by all of the Bible. Now, how do I know that word all means every part of the whole? But now, is it every part of only his writings or is it every part of the whole Bible? How am I going to find out what that word all refers to? The law of antecedents. There is a precedent in context. Let's go back. Verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. When Timothy was being brought up, Pauline writings were not in existence. So what is Paul referring to here? The writings of Moses are all the so-called Old Testament. Now, by the time we get to the book of 2 Timothy, all of the Pauline writings are um, completed. Here, we've got uh, 65, 66 AD. All of the Pauline writings are completed. So when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, what two portions of scripture is he talking about? Number one, the all means, Timothy, all that you learned as a lad before I ever wrote anything. What Moses wrote, what Isaiah wrote, what David wrote in the Psalms, what all the rest of the prophets wrote. Those things are scriptures by which you are, uh, are benefited and by which you are matured. Then he includes his own. For, now, here are all my writings. We go all the way back to his first book, uh, 1 Thessalonians, which was written in 54 A.D., all the way now to about 65, 66 A.D., the last um, book of the Bible here, uh, the second Timothy that he wrote. Therefore, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, how did we settle that argument? By hermeneutics. 
by understanding that there are laws that govern the comprehension of language. Therefore, when Paul says all scriptures, he includes all of the Bible uh, and especially his own. Now, we're going to look at some of these others here in just one second. But before we do, let's go to Exodus chapter 16. Now, I take you here because somebody's going to smugly say, well, you dispensationalists, and I've heard them. I've been there. Therefore, I'm justified in, you know, using their type of smugness in my speech. You dispensationalists, you throw out half the Bible and only take the writings of Paul. I take all the Bible for my obedience. Okay, right. Let's, let's do that. Chapter 16 in the book of Exodus. Now, it says, verse number 11, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. I speak unto them, saying, At even you'll eat flesh, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. And you'll know that I am the Lord your God. It came to pass at evening, verse 13, the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there was a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It's manna, for they knew not what it was. Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Oh, get that? All the Bibles for our obedience. Israel was commanded to do what? Note. Gather it of every man according to his eating. An omer for every man. That's just a measure according to the number of your persons. Verse 17. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. Last part of verse 18. They gathered every man according to his eating. Let me ask you this. Did you obey the Bible this morning? Did you gather your manna according to your eating? Oh, you're going to say, well, now it's the, quote, Christian Sabbath. They weren't supposed to gather on the Sabbath. Oh, no, their Sabbath was Saturday. This is the first day of the week. They were to gather then. Did you gather it? What's the matter? Why couldn't you obey the Bible? That's what it says. God commanded. How long were they supposed to eat it? No, verse number 35. Children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to the land inhabited. In other words, they were to eat manna until they came to the promised land. Now, the promised land is the land of Palestine. When is the uh, next jet out that we're going to book to get over to the promised land so we can quit gathering our manna? Uh, are, you, are you booked? Are you going to go over there? I'll tell you, right now, I would be a little bit afraid to go over there. Not the, that I'm not prepared to go. I'm just not ready if we got preaching the gospel amidst those Arabs in, in, in some of those uh, cities there in the east part of Jerusalem. Okay? Note, they were to eat the manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. Now let's go to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. In verse 10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. And they did, they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes, parched corn on the self same day, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten the corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. They did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. This is Joshua 5, 10 through 12. Now, how do I know that we're not supposed to eat manna anymore? Number one, God has not given it. Number two, it was given during the transition time from Egypt to the, to the Canaan, Canaan land. Number three, God stopped it once they got in the land. 
It was for Israel under another dispensation. It was never given to us Gentiles, and you will never eat manna, never. That, that actually comes from God down here. Gather it up, bring it into your house, put a little syrup or salt, whatever, whatever you do. It's probably like grits. You can put a little butter or salt or whatever, whatever else you can, you know. They, uh, they looked at it and said, manna, what is it? I look at grits and say, manna, what is it? I've never figured this out. How, how are you supposed to eat it? They couldn't figure it out either. You cannot directly fulfill that command. That's the point I'm trying to make. And in order to understand the Bible, you have to understand that hermeneutical principle. That there are certain things that were cer for certain people at certain times that were never meant for you. Now, were they meant for your learning? Yes. And can you benefit by a principle? Yes. What's the principle? Well, uh, number one, he came to his own, Israel, and his own received him not. They didn't know who he was or what he was. They looked at the manna, the bread from heaven, and said, manna, what is it? They looked at Jesus Christ and they said to him, the true bread of life from heaven. And he said, manna, what is it? Who is this guy? Is there a principle there? Yes. They didn't understand the bread from heaven in the first place. They didn't understand it in the second place. Uh, is there another principle we can glean? Yes. How often was Israel supposed to go out and take up the manna for their own eating? Daily. The manna represents the bread of life, whether it's the living word or the written word. Guess what? How often are you to have devotions? Daily. In fact, there's a good principle here. No Bible, no breakfast. Now, probably we, <laughs> that's not a hermeneutical principle. That's just uh, uh, I lost my crowd after I said that. Oh, fast wait one second. Surely you're not. Well, that'd be a good way to get your devotions in. No Bible, no breakfast, which just simply means if um, if you want breakfast, you have to get up just a few minutes early and get the bread of life in first. OK, now. If you're going to say, physician, heal thyself, do you follow that? Uh, I try. But uh, sometimes I can't have my devotions before my morning coffee. So, you know, cut me a little slack. You have to do the same thing. All right. What are we doing here? I don't know. Uh, except that we're talking about hermeneutical principles. One of them we just saw. How can we understand the Bible? Somebody says it's just Paul's writings. Somebody says it's all of the Bible in context there. We go to the hermeneutical principle of antecedents. There is a precedent in context which will always allow us to understand what is being said. Now, the greatest principle of all is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. And it is the hermeneutical principle of rightly dividing the word of truth. What did we just do when we used the law of antecedents? We divided the word accurately. We, we learned where it fit, how to bring out the real meaning of it. Only then can you know what it really means to you, what you're supposed to do. Now, we saw this one. We'll not go back to it, but we're going to go back to two more after we explain rightly dividing. Verse number 15, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, this word, ortho tomeo, means to cut straight or accurately. We get various words from it. Uh, for, for example, the orthodontist. Uh, we go to him to straighten out our teeth. And that is one of the best ways. Uh, here is a, a, a bright and shining smile, if you've never seen one, right in front of you. Feature of these was, uh, was um, a tooth. The orthodontist would come and say, well, now we've got to straighten this one out. We've got to align this one so that each is, al is aligned to one another. And that ex is exactly the concept of rightly dividing the word of truth. Whether it's a, a category of doctrine, whether it's a, a, a dispensation or, or on and on, we can learn what the Bible has uh, to say literally by utilizing this 
principle. It means to align precisely. It means to cut it decisively or sharply so that you can know the difference between the two. Now, uh, what if you had a cavity over here in this tooth and the dentist was going to put the, put the filling in this tooth, which was a whole one? Wouldn't you protest? Wait a minute, you've got the wrong tooth. Uh, uh, this is something that uh, doesn't just happen on the Three Stooges. This is something that can happen in real life. But so many people do this very same thing when it comes to Bible doctrine. They, they want to correct something in their life that's over here that, uh, that is an incorrect doctrine, but they're going to the wrong place. What do they have to do? You have to, as we have just done, rightly divide the word. That's the only way that you can address the issue. Now, Let's go back to the book of Daniel. I have a, another pastor friend who's gotten a hold of uh, some writings from a guy uh, out of North Carolina. And the guy out of North Carolina says, that the he of verse number 27 refers to Messiah rather than to Antichrist, okay? We're going to use the law of antecedents. Verse number 27 says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the abomination of desolation, and he shall make it desolate until the consummation. All right, now three times we have this personal pronoun, he, used. Now somebody has already written books saying, well, that's talking about Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came, he made a covenant with Israel. And uh, uh, when he started his earthly ministry, and about three and a half years later, it ended with his crucifixion on the cross. Okay? It didn't, doesn't start the tribulation period because this is not referring to Antichrist. I've got, got the books. There's a set of about nine or ten of them, and I read some of them. But, uh, but how could I, in one fell swoop, in one uh, easy lesson, disprove all of this? By the law of antecedents. There's something that goes before. The nearest reference to the pronoun in the law of antecedents or precedents is the one that qualifies the pronoun. That's another law of language. Verse number 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, now, what is the nearest reference that qualifies this pronoun? Is it Messiah or the prince that shall come? You see? It's the prince that shall come. It's his people that destroyed Jerusalem. The Jews didn't destroy it. The Romans did. So how do I know that it's not referring to the Lord Jesus Christ? Simply because I used a hermeneutical principle. And that is the law of language dictates that the nearest qualifying phrase or, or word uh, to the pronoun is the one that's to be used. He is the prince that shall come. Now let's go to another one, Romans 8, 28. It's not so clear in the English translation. Why? Because for some reason, the uh, people who translated the King James Bible uh, turned some of the sentence around. It says this, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Okay, only the Greek sentence says this, to those loving God, now, the reason that I say that is in this verse, we either have all things coming together by chance or all things coming together by God. On the end of the word works there is a third person singular suffix dictating that it's he works. Not all things work. He works. 
And here is the way it is literally in the Greek. To those loving God, there is the precedent in the, in the syntax of the original Greek language. Third person singular suffix on sunergai, he. Now, who is the he referring to? There is a precedent in the syntax of the Greek language. God. He, God, works all things together for good. The other way is all things work together for good. You know, I've heard unbelievers use it. Well, all things work together for good. An unbeliever dies. And, well, uh, all things work together for good. Uh, they've finally gotten their peace. And I want to say, oh, no, they haven't. <laughs> Uh, they, they're not resting in peace right now if they're an unbeliever. But, but it's in the Bible. No, uh -uh. the Bible says to those loving God, he, God, works all things together for good. You see, God was judging the individual if that person died in unbelief and went to hell. Uh, that's, that's not good. That's not a good outcome. Uh, dis despite all the positive thinking you want, and they're resting in that casket. Nonsense. If they've gone to hell, they've not found their eternal peace. They are tormented forever. So, understanding these things uh, is extremely important to finally understanding the Bible. And it's true interpretation, which there's only one uh, for us. All right? Therefore, we're on the, the second uh, study paragraph here, as we've got it. We call Paul's method of interpreting the Bible incisive segmentation. See, we, we want to be sophisticated here. We don't want the world to outdo us. No, actually, it's much simpler than that. Paul believes in cutting straight the Bible. What better philosophy to have of inter Bible interpretation than what I call the sliced Bible teaching method? So we're going to see just what the sliced Bible teaching method is. Number one, the Bible should be learned, and this is uh, an acronym for our method. It should be learned, letter S, systematically. Now, Where is Christianity failing today? Christianity is failing because men give up, uh, uh, get up and give a speech about the Bible or about a moral principle. But they do not teach the Bible systematically. Now, what's the problem with that? We just learned this morning in Sunday school, and it was a great reminder that there is a process of education that begins in early age that ends up in our adult years. You have to learn the ABCs before you can learn what? Words. Well, you have to learn what words are as parts of speech before you can learn what? How to put together sentences. We have to learn that a group of sentences together addressing one main issue or thought is a paragraph. And then once you understand that, that there are groups of paragraphs together on one main heading or thought, and that is a chapter. And then once you have all of your chapters together and you've comprehensively covered what you want to say, you can put it together in a book, you see. Now, what have I done? I have just shown that that's what it takes in order to, to accomplish a book. You've got to learn the letters first, the word second. What is that? That is systematic learning. You've got to learn what one is before you can learn what two is. And that one and one make two. So, if you're going to talk about learning the Bible, you have got to learn it systematically. And when I came across this principle, I, I determined, God, I am going, this is what I want for my ministry, to take a subject and to teach it to people until they learn it so much. And here's another principle. It's not what you hear and forget that is true learning. It is what you have heard and cannot forget that is true learning. So that when you take it out, you can now, if anybody talks with you re uh, regarding understanding the Bible and uh, all of it is for me, you now have um, some fodder for the, can for the cannon here. I mean, you now have some ammunition. You now have been taught something that's important to understanding the Bible. Hermeneutics. 
and principles of language so that you can know what a portion of Scripture is uh, talking about. And then it uh, goes on to that of doctrines. It must be considered systematically. Our public schools are based on system, the systematic learning of academic truths. Why would God change that with regard to his learning system? He has not. Isaiah 28. The only difference is you have to be saved, spirit-filled, in order to learn his truth. Isaiah 28, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept, this is Isaiah 28, 10. Precept must be upon precept. Here is one, here is two, one and one make two. That is a precept, built upon another precept. Uh, we've learned what the numbers are. Now we've learned what addition is. Then we can learn what subtraction is. Then we can learn what division is. But it must be built upon precept. The one must have a foundation before you can learn the other. Line upon line, that is, you align the truths. Uh, a, B, C's and one, two, threes are two different categories of truth. If you're in the English class and you say to the teacher, one and one is two, she said, wait a minute, I don't want one and one, I want ABCs. Have you learned your ABCs, not one, two, threes? You've got to bring forth the right category of truth to the question or issue if you want to succeed. That's why truth must be adjusted to truth. You must learn that this category is English, this category is math, this category is biology, and we'll see that in just a little bit. You never thought that somebody could preach from hermeneutics, could you? Okay. Verse 13. The word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You know, the interesting thing about this is that verse 12 says that here is the answer to a life of peace and rest. People don't have a, a comprehensive or a, a, um, a, a proper understanding of the scriptures, and so therefore they live their lives tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But systematic Bible teaching, this is the rest, what? Line upon line, precept upon precept, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Why aren't they refreshed and why are they tired? Simply because they haven't learned the Bible systematically. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. 